Picture this. You're on a nice family road trip across the country, but you're starting to get a little hungry. You decide to pull over for a quick bite at a local road stop restaurant. A juicy burger sounds delicious right now, so you order one. Well, little did you know you'd be biting into a burger full of human meat. The meal was courtesy of none other than the sicko Joe Metheny. Thankfully, he's no longer serving up people. He's just serving time. But how did this all start? You could probably guess that Joe isn't exactly the nicest of guys. So his wife left him and took their son with her. When he found out he'd been abandoned, he was furious and searched everywhere for his family. One of the first places he looked was under a bridge where his wife used to hide out and do drugs. He didn't find her, but there were two other guys that she used to hang out with there. And when they couldn't tell him where his wife and son were, Joe took his anger out on them. He killed them with an axe. And then, when he saw a nearby fisherman witness his actions, he killed him too. But this was just his first go-around with murder, so Joe panicked, dumping the bodies into the river. Authorities took him in and tried to convict him for the crime, but sadly there wasn't enough evidence, allowing Joe to go free and continue his search. Now, with some killing experience, Joe went on to kill two prostitutes too. He took their bodies, raped them, then chopped them up, leaving the good parts to be used for burgers and leaving the rest in an empty lot. With what he kept, he mixed it with pork and beef to make the patties that he would soon sell to unsuspecting customers. In his confession to police, Joe admitted to killing over 10 people and disposing of them this way. What's even more disturbing is that he said he would never have stopped if he hadn't been caught. Since his conviction in 1996, where he received the death penalty, Joe simply waited and rotted away in his prison cell until he was found dead in 2017. The saddest part of all is that he didn't seem to feel guilty or sorry in any way for his unspeakable crimes. What a psycho. 7. Cold Case Dorothy Scott was your typical hard-working single mom, just trying to earn a living and care for her young son, Sean. After a meeting finished up at her job, she realized that one of her co-workers had a strange-looking bite mark on their arm. So being the nice woman she was, Dorothy drove them to the nearest medical center. She then went back to her parents' house where Sean was to check on him, changed into an interesting red scarf, then left again. Her colleagues were waiting for her to come back to the hospital and pick them up after getting checked out. But as her white car pulled into the lot, it made a sharp turn and backed out. Later on, Dorothy's station wagon was found abandoned in an empty alleyway set on fire. Four years after her disappearance, her bones were found at a construction site. Authorities believe that two years prior to their discovery, a small fire that had broken out in the area caused them to become charred and ashy. Sadly, the mother's cause of death was never determined. There are theories on who could have been responsible, though. Weeks before that fateful night at the hospital, Dorothy kept getting calls from a mysterious number. It was a man on the other side of the phone, and he would say odd and unsettling things like, I've got her, then suddenly hang up. The calls were repeated every week until Dorothy went missing. But in 1984, when her bones were found, they started again. They didn't stop after Dorothy was dead, either. The caller regularly phoned Dorothy's parents, too, describing chilling details of her life to them, and even knowing what she was wearing the day she went missing. The man on the line confessed, saying, I killed her. He went on to describe how he was in love with Dorothy, but she somehow betrayed him with another man. Despite this confession over the phone, police were never able to trace the number or man that called. Dorothy's supposed killer could still be out there somewhere, roaming the streets and waiting for another victim. 6. Troubles of a Socialite Imagine being born with almost everything you could ever want. Money, a prominent family, and one of the most beautiful faces in New York. This just so happened to be the case with the socialite Barbara Bakeland. As an adult, she worked as a model for some of the biggest names in the business, including magazines like Vogue. But hidden just beneath her gorgeous looks were deep-rooted mental health issues. This, of course, was unknown to her future spouse, Brooke Bakeland a mega-rich pilot who was the grandson of the man that literally invented plastic. With this marriage, Barbara sealed her spot for a life of luxury. 
But even with more money you'd ever know what to do with, problems can arise. The Bakelins were not a very happy couple. They had a son together named Anthony, but both husband and wife participated in multiple affairs that led to unrest and unhappiness in their lap of luxury. It was bad enough that Barbara tried to take her own life several times. With such a complicated upbringing, Anthony decided to go on his own journey in 1967. During this time, he met a man that he shared an incredibly close and intimate relationship with, and Barbara did not approve. The next part of the story varies depending on who you ask, but many believe that due to Barbara's psychotic episodes, she truly thought the only way her son could be cured of homosexuality was to sleep with him herself. She was, after all, one of the most beautiful women in New York, 30 years prior. This damaged Tony even more than anyone could imagine, and he was later diagnosed with schizophrenia. It was around this time that Brooke divorced Barbara, viciously cutting her and their son out of his life. Tony felt an odd connection to his mother, as if she was controlling him. And one night during an argument between the two, Tony struck his mom. She ran into the kitchen to try and get away, but her son grabbed a knife and stabbed her without a single hint of remorse. Due to the money and influence his family had, Tony was sent to a mental hospital called Broadmoor, but was eventually released. Just days after, he tried to kill his own grandmother, one of the only people to take pity on him after the first murder. The police arrived to see him straddling the 87-year-old woman and stabbing her repeatedly. This time, he went straight to jail. You know that saying, more money, more problems? Do you think if this family wasn't so filthy rich, things would have been different for them? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. 5. Co-joined Twins Scientists and ordinary people alike have had a strange obsession with twins for centuries, it seems. From the evil experiments of Dr. Josef Mengele during the Holocaust, to TV shows like American Horror Story, twins don't exactly get the red carpet treatment in history and media. And unfortunately, this next story follows the trend. Back in the time of Soviet Russia, a pair of co-joined twins were born. Their names were Masha and Dasha Krivoshlayapova, and they each had a head and torso, and an arm and leg each. Immediately after being born, doctors seized the girls and subjected them to inhumane treatment. The mother refused to give them up, so she was told that they died from pneumonia. The lie worked, and scientists got to carry out their sick experiments. Besides being co-joined, what made the girls so interesting to the researchers? Well, interestingly enough, Masha and Dasha had two different nervous systems while sharing a single circulatory system. Because of this fact, the scientists pushed the twins' limits to the extremes to test how their body performed. They'd make them stay awake as long as they could, sometimes for days on end. They wouldn't feed them to see how the body reacted to a state of starvation. They were injected with countless strange chemicals and substances, and much more. Their first 12 years of life were absolute torture. Thankfully, the girls were eventually set free after Stalin's rule came to an end. With two entirely different personalities, Dasha was sympathetic to those that tortured the pair, while Masha wanted them to be executed. Sadly, after living such a tough life, the twins passed away in 2003. They were 53 years old at the time. It's hard to imagine the effect a life of torture could have on someone. But at the very least, they had each other. 4. Model Murder One Thanksgiving took an ugly turn when a model and her husband got into a heated dispute. The 23-year-old girl, Omeima Nelson, and her husband, twice her age at 56, Bill Nelson, had more than a few bumps in their marriage. The older man had repeatedly sold his beautiful young wife to other men so they could perform sexual acts on her. It happened numerous times, and Bill accepted anything from cash, rent money, to a car, in exchange for Omeima's misery. In 1991, when the day should have been all about giving thanks in the country, Omeima took a pair of scissors and stabbed her husband in the chest. She then took a clothing iron and hit him until he stopped moving. In the process, Omeima broke her hand. 
According to police, when Bill was dead, she chopped his dead body up, taking his hands and boiling them in hot water to take off his fingerprints. Omema also put his head in the freezer and took his genitals off with a knife. A psychiatrist that interviewed her after she'd been taken into custody said that she admitted to something that haunt him for years. Apparently, to celebrate the holiday, Omema put her husband's ribs in the oven with some barbecue sauce, then ate them. While trying to dispose of the rest of Bill's remains, police caught her. Later on, Omema claimed that Bill would often rape her and tie her up. She said the murder was an act of self-defense since he had raped her earlier that morning, and she thought he might kill her. At trial, Omema denied eating Bill, but the jury wasn't convinced as the courtroom walls were lined with photos of Bill's deep-fried hands, frozen head, and skinned torso. She was given 27 years in prison. Three. Lovers. One October night in 2006, police were called to the scene of a suicide for a man named Zach Bowen. Strangely enough, when they reached into his pocket, they found a note detailing a gruesome murder confession. Unable to handle the guilt after killing his girlfriend, he took his own life. In the note, he gave police the address to the small apartment the couple lived in. During their relationship, Addie and Zach both had personal demons that they battled. It was believed that Addie had undiagnosed bipolar disorder, while Zach had struggled for most of his life with his self-image and confidence. Their friends said that they were often seen either drunk or high on something together. And when Hurricane Katrina hit, they thrived in the apocalypse-like environment, trading food and raiding abandoned bars. They were even labeled by news outlets at the time as the so-called king and queen of the hurricane survivors. So how did a love life like theirs turn sour? Apparently the drugs mixed with Zach's past of an ex-wife and children caused the pair to get into frequent arguments, leading to a steady off and on again relationship. Soon Addie kicked Zach out of their apartment, which made him snap. He strangled her, then raped her corpse. He soon began cutting up her body and placing it in pots, pans, and the fridge to try and dispose of it. While this seems like the average cut-and-dry murder-suicide, some paranormal enthusiasts believe there may have been another cause for the couple's demise. The apartment the two lived in was right above a voodoo shop. Some think that a sinister force or possible curse could have pushed Zack to the breaking point. But there hasn't been any proof of that. 2. Parents Are Out Crystal Brooke Howell invited several of her friends over one night and told them all that her father had killed himself earlier that day and that they could all live in their house since he was gone. The teenagers, Crystal being 17 at the time, spent the next few days driving her father's car and spending his money. But the joyride was cut short. After living it up and partying, even going so far as putting a stripper pole in her dad's kitchen, Crystal's friends eventually found a body the body of her father. The young girl had murdered him days before he had allegedly committed suicide. While talking to police, she says she decided to do it after he caught her stealing earlier the same day. She had taken a shotgun and killed him in his sleep. After he was gone, she put his body in multiple plastic tubs and hid it in the shed. To cover up her crime, Crystal went on to sell the gun she used. After her friends found out, they told the cops and Crystal was arrested. It's surprising that one, a daughter could kill her own father, and two, go on to have parties in the house right after the crime. Some people are just truly sick. One, maniac with a knife. In 2001, the country of Japan was shocked at one of the most heinous crimes ever committed on their soil. An adult man had broken into an elementary school and terrorized countless children. He went on a 10-minute rampage, killing 8 kids and injuring 21 others. Hundreds ran away screaming and crying. Eventually, some teachers were able to take him down and restrain him before police could make it to the school. The man behind the crime was named Momoro Takuma. Apparently, he had taken a large amount of tranquilizers that left him heavily confused and in a deranged state. On top of this, he had a long history of mental illness and charges of sexual assault on his record. He was sent to prison in 2003 and executed a year later. Before his death, Takuma showed zero remorse for what he did to the children. 
Despite traumatizing hundreds of kids for life, he continued to have no guilt until his final breath. He was even recorded saying, I should have used gasoline, so I could have killed more than I did.